Welcome back, Chappelle. Oh my God, welcome back. It's been like ah, almost two weeks since I've seen you guys last. Just a couple of really quick, fast shout out. Um, I miss you guys terribly, right? I hate that we're not together right now, and I hate um, that we miss so much time at school together. But you know what? It's okay, because we're going to come back, we're going to bounce back, we're going to thrive, and we're going to keep killing it, okay? Now, what I would suggest that you be doing right now is definitely completing your study guide, right? Keeping that stuff fresh on your mind. And also, check your email real quick, right? Check your email, because I'm sending out an email today that's going to outline kind of exactly what's going on with the schedule and what's going back is going to look like. And the fact that we are going to take a day before we take our test, C period, you can stop sweating right now, and we're going to actually have some days of review and stuff like that, okay? So don't worry, I will get you 100% prepared for your first test. Ida came at a really bad time when it comes to getting ready for tests and stuff like that in my class, but you know what, it's okay, all right? So if you're watching this right now, that means more than likely you're in my C period. If you're my D or G period, you've actually seen me once already and we've been back to school, okay? So still know that I did miss you terribly and I'm sure I told you in class and stuff like that and I'm so excited to get back and see you guys soon. But let's go ahead and dive right into where some of our girls in C, or P C period left off, right? So I think it was uh, Emily Manning and Maddie Evans and a couple other people. You all had to leave the day of the pep rally a little bit early, so we're going to catch you back up based on the stuff that we actually talked about when you left, okay? So big thing you need to understand is that entire first half of this flip we talked about, the Peloponnesian War, right? The war between Athens and Sparta that lasted for 27 years. It was a massive stalemate between the Delian League led by Athens and the Peloponnesian League led by Sparta, right? We talked about how it was just going to kind of leave Greece in absolute rubble, and that's going to leave time and room for this guy named Philip II of Macedonia to enter into the picture, right? He organizes his people of Macedonia together, who are kind of a bunch of like backwards citizens of this mountainous country north of Greece, right? But he organizes them into a structured military as a professional at using the phalanx, and then decides to go off and conquer all of Greece. And he conquers every single place in Greece except Sparta, right? The only place he left alone was Sparta. Remember that note? If. Like, so, like, right? That's a big thing you need to remember. But he did all of this with his son at his side. And his son's name, of course, was Alexander, right? And Alexander at the time was just known as Alexander III and was actually, there's a big myth, you know, we talked about it in class, big myth about Philip seeing his wife and stuff like that. That's why he lost his eye and blah, 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 blah. And Alexander apparently, according to most Macedonians, was destined for greatness, right? He had a, a fantastic tutor in Aristotle and he was very, very smart militarily from his father and very intelligent philosophically from his tutor Aristotle, right? So Alexander III decide, or not, Alexander and Philip decide that they then want to go off and conquer Persia, right? To get back at Persia for all those invasions that they did against the Greeks in 480, 490, and I believe like 501 BC, right? Under Darius and Xerxes. Philip and Alexander decide they're going to go out there and conquer the entire Persian Empire because it's very weak at this point because it's being led by a very weak leader, a guy named Darius III, right? So something you need to understand, though, is that Philip doesn't get a chance to go out there and do that because Philip gets stabbed to death at his daughter's wedding, right, by one of his bodyguards. And we talked about that really screwed up story in class, which is super weird and really kind of reflects the negative, like, views of women's rights in Greece, right? But the big thing about it, though, he's assassinated by, like, at his daughter's wedding by a bodyguard. And so what ends up happening is Olympias, one of Philip's seven, count them, seven wives. Philip had seven different wives, Philip II of Macedonia. And he's going to, she's, the one of them, Olympias, is going to outmaneuver all of them and place her son, Alexander, on the throne. So now Alexander is only 19, and he is the ruler of all of, like, the Macedonian Empire, right? And so when he turns 20, he decides that he is going to reflect upon what he promised his father, and he is going to build an army big enough to go off and conquer Persia, right? And he creates a massive military, including a navy, and ground troops, and phalanx, and cavalry units, which is a very big deal because these were very non-used by Sparta and Athens in their military functions. Cavalry is a bunch of guys on mounted horseback. Josie, get down. Jo I'm sorry. She's right now obsessed with like catching lizards again. So this is, that's Josie, by the way. Say hi, Josie. 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 See, she doesn't even know her name. All right. So anyway, now, so the big thing is though, okay. Uh, Josie, you want to get on the couch? 
You want to get up on the couch? So Alexander is going to go off and try to conquer Persia, and it's going to be Alexander right here versus Darius the Third right there, right? And so what ends up happening is Alexander basically like sends word to Darius that, hey, man, I'm coming to conquer your empire. I know that you're a very weak military leader, and I know that you're not that strong of a military Come here. Come here. Thank you. All right, so I know that you're not that strong of a military leader, right? I know that you're not that strong of a military leader, but I'm going to come and conquer you anyway, right? So the big thing that ends up happening, though, is that he starts chasing after Darius the Third, Because Darius the Third actually is like, oh, <laughs> it's not going to be a big deal. You're not going to be able to beat me. Look at my massive empire. And he actually even brought his wife and his sons or his children to watch him defeat Alexander the Great, so-called, in battle. But what ends up happening in some of the earliest battles is Alexander starts winning, right? He wins a lot, and he wins over and over and over again. And he never once lost a battle in over 300 different battles while he was conquering all of Persia. One of the craziest stories actually happened right here outside of Egypt when Alexander III's armies were stranded in a desert because at one point Darius was just losing battle after battle after battle after battle. And so he runs to Egypt to hide there using the desert around him kind of as a excuse me, as a natural barrier. And what ends up going down is something we talked about in class when, like, all the men, like, collect water for Alexander, and then Alexander dumps the water out, and he's like, I don't drink if you don't drink, and they're like, I'll dive you! And then they end up going over there and taking it over anyway. Now, what ends up happening, though, is Alexander does end up taking over the entire Persian Empire after never losing one of those 300 battles, right? Not even one when he came up against war elephants in India. And that's why his, like, there's a town in India named Bucephala, named after his horse Bucephalus, who died defending him and actually, like, was, like, considered Alexander's best friend. We talked about that in class as well. Now, before setting out again, though, this is where we got cut off because of the, of the, what you call it, the um, pep rally. So most of you will be starting your notes right here. So if you actually are in C period, you're like, I talked about all that stuff in class already. I recorded that for the girls that had to leave early to go to the pep rally. This is where you start taking your notes. But it also works, too, because it's like a little refresher over the stuff that we talked about in the first place. Now, before setting out again, though, after defeating Darius III in battle, after taking over the entire Persian Empire, after having his one of his captains crucified because he actually killed Darius before he got a chance to, all this other stuff... Before setting out again, though, Alexander unexpectedly died from a sudden fever, right? Now, he we don't know what that fever was. It could have been any number of things. Um, some people think it could have been the flu. Some people think it could have been syphilis and some other things like that, which hopefully it wasn't syphilis. Uh, so the big thing, though, is his three wives were there at his bedside, right? His three wives were sitting there, and they were like, Alexander, Alexander. Who do we leave the empire to? Who do we leave it to? You were the one that was like controlled this whole thing. And he died, and in his last breath, he was like, oh, leave it to the best. And then he just dies, right? And what ends up happening, since he said, leave it to the best, they were like, okay, I guess we leave it to his three most powerful generals, right? And what ends up happening, though, do men share power very well? No. All right, so, and over the next 300 years, the empire would slowly fall apart through men battling for control, right? Now, the big thing that's going to end up happening way, way, way later, though, is put a little star underneath that and write this down. The Romans would be the ones that take them over, right? So the Romans are going to show up several hundred years down the road, and they're actually going to completely dominate and take over what was left of the Hellenistic Empire. Now, their last very famous leader of the Hellenistic Empire was actually a woman. We'll talk about her a lot when we get into the Rome unit, right? So Alexander dies, and they took his body, and they put it inside of a coffin full of honey. Right? So, they, because honey is the only natural food that doesn't ever go bad. And so they placed Alexander's body inside of it, and they took his body off to be buried. And apparently, according to legend, they killed every man that was there to actually see where he was buried so no one would be able to desecrate his tomb. Right? And we actually have no clue where Alexander's dead body is to this day. So, now the big thing, though, that's going to follow right after, right? Because if you actually looked at all the eight Greek time periods, they kind of begin and end with a major event, right? The Neolithic end period starts with farming, ends with bronze making. Early Bronze Period ends with the Minoans. Hi, baby. Um, so here's the better one. Here's the, the good boy. Hey, wait, don't be shy. Now, like, the big thing, though, okay, that ends up happening is after Alexander's death, just like after the Persian Wars, when the Classical Period started, after Alexander's death starts the Hellenistic Period, right? Because if you look at his empire, this is all the stuff that Alexander took over. When he never lost one of those 300 battles, when he destroyed Darius III's entire empire, when he actually sat his home city known as what you call it yeah uh known as persepolis yeah so 
This giant empire, as you can see though, is a blending of a lot of different groups, right? It's a blend of Greek, Persian, Egyptian, and Northern Indian cultures, right? So it actually is a massive proponent of cultural diffusion, right? So cultural diffusion is that very important word that means the spread of traits through war and trade. You need to remember that word. It's very important. It's one of your fill in the blanks, all right? So now, the big thing though is this is going to bring on a golden age, right? And so the Hellenistic period is going to be considered another golden age that follows the classical period, right? And then classical classical Greece where there was the growth of theater and art and it was known as the age of Pericles, right? And the Parthenon was built. Hey, sweetie. Oh, thank you. Now, the big thing, though, is that Alexandria... Alexandria is going to be the capital of Egypt, right? And that Alexandria, Egypt is going to be the capital of this new Hellenistic Empire. And so it's going to boast everything because cultural diffusion is so avid in this area. They've got Greek marble, Arabic spices, and it's home to over a million people. Also, fun fact, it was home to one of the largest libraries the world had ever seen, known as the Library of Alexandria, which to this day considered one of the biggest tragedies in all of history and all of Western civilization's history was when that, that, uh, when that, library got burnt down by Caesar and his guys, but we don't talk about that, all right, so like now, but the library of Alexandria was burnt, and there's actually a lot of like old intelligence that we actually lost when that library in Alexandria, Egypt was destroyed, because it was a fusion of everything intelligent from Persia, northern India, uh, Greece, and even Egyptian ideas, right, and so as you can see right here, you can see cultural diffusion happening in some of the artifacts from Alexandria, Egypt, and from the Hellenistic Empire, right, hey baby, um, so the big thing though is these are sarcophagi, right? Or sarcophaguses? Sarco I believe it's sarcophagi, right? But sarcophagus is what you put a mummy inside of, right? And so as we know, mummification is an Egyptian process that they use to actually keep the body fully intact. What's weird about these sarcophagus, and a lot of it has to do with the look of the faces on the front of them. That's not what an Egyptian looks like. Egyptians typically had tanner or higher amounts of melanin in their skin, so they would have been darker complexion, right? This person looks Mediterranean, right? So, and that's because literally the Egyptians started mummifying dead Greeks, right? Because that's who they were being controlled by, or not being controlled by, but the fusion of these ideas. You had Greek people going through the process of mummification, which is an Egyptian idea. So that's a big example right there of the blending and the fusion of all those great ideas coming in, cultural diffusion, right? So the big thing also, though, is women were also higher status in the Hellenistic age and were veered. Some became poets and philosophers, and even their last major ruler was a woman, and that's Cleopatra VII. Cleopatra Cleopatra was the last ruler of the Hellenistic Empire, right? Before she unfortunately lost a set of battles to a guy named Augustus because her boyfriend, Mark Antony, and this whole other thing, well, we'll talk about that story a little bit later on, right? So just snake and and then she died, right? So stop trying to catch the lizards. You're not ever going to catch one, all right? So anyway, now, so the big thing, though, also is art is going to take a massive leap forward. This is one of the most famous pieces of art to come out of the Hellenistic Empire. Of course, it is damaged because the arms have been broken off, but that is the Venus de Milo, right? So the Venus de Milo is so famous that it's shown up in even, like, major shows and stuff like this one. That is the rarest gummy of them all, the gummy Venus de Milo, carved by gummy artisans who work exclusively in the medium of gummy. Will you two stop saying gummy so much? So as you can see, like, even the Simpsons have talked about the artwork that has come out of the Hellenistic period. That's how famous this stuff is. Isn't that right, Shahira? Yeah, that's right, Shahira. Like, when she said in class, it's like, oh my god, this stuff legit is everywhere, right? It's like in your face all the time, and you just don't even realize it. So, also, the Hellenistic philosophers and idea makers are going to map the solar system, and they're going to propose two new ideas, right? Some are going to say, oh, we're a heliocentric universe, where the sun is in the middle and everything goes around it. And then others are going to be like, no, I think we're a geocentric universe, where the Earth is in the middle and the universe goes around it. Now we know in the modern era that this one is right, but it's really important to know that several hundred years before Christ was even born, people were theorizing the idea of a heliocentric universe. And it took all the way up until the 1600s AD in Europe for that idea to become universally accepted, right? So people lost their lives at one point for proposing that the sun was in the middle and the earth went around it. When several, like thousand years before they even were alive, 
people were already proposing that idea. This shows how intelligent the, uh, the Hellenistic Empire was, right? They even had advances in medicine. Like, for example, they started creating simple procedures and trying to prevent infections. And then another guy, a very famous guy named Hippocrates, came up with this concept known as the Hippocratic Oath during the Hellenistic Empire, which is that a doctor is required to serve someone if they are sick because that is the ethical thing to do regardless of how much money they have. If they have a person in front of them that is dying, they must do their best to help them, right? And that is actually created by Hippocrates, right? Hence the Hippocratic Oath, right? And that, of course, is the Venus de Milo again. And then another really famous figure is a guy named Archimedes, okay? Archimedes is very important. You need to highlight him really, really quickly. Archimedes was a guy that was a, considered the scientist, the seminal thinker of the Hellenistic Empire, and he just serves as an example of how intelligent the Hellenistic people were, right? And had it not been for battles between rulers and governments, then the Hellenistic Empire could have just kept going forward, right? Now, the thing about it though, is that Archimedes, being this Hellenistic inventor, came up with tons of different stuff. He's like the Einstein of the Hellenistic Empire, right? He came up with this thing right here called the Archimedes screw, which is the very first well, right? And that uses actually a very simple screw-like function to twist and pull things up from a lower level. The My part-time job, I do tours at a brewery, and we use one of these screws still to bring malt into the actual tons where like the brewing process happens, right? So like this thing right here, the Archimedes Media screw is a phenomenal invention. It was made over a thousand years ago in the Hellenistic Empire. He came up with theories on density as well, as well as theories on volume and density. There's a very famous story that I'll actually tell you really quick, where Archimedes was presented with a crown by one of the rulers of the Hellenistic Empire. And he said, I've been paid a debt in this crown, and the guy who's paid me has told me that it's solid gold, but I don't believe him. Is there any way that you can figure out what this thing is made of without you without hurting it or breaking it, right? I want you to figure out, is this thing made of gold without like actually screwing into it? And so Archimedes apparently was like, I can't figure this out, I can't figure this out, I can't figure this out. And he couldn't figure out how he was going to look at this crown and figure out what, if anything, it's made of. And he goes and he's like, you know what, I'll take a bath. That's how I'll figure this out. I'll take a bath, I'll soak, and that's what I'll do, right? And so he goes into his home and he fills his bathtub up and then he goes down and he sits down in his bathtub and he notices the water level on the sides of it rise depending on things that are going in and the density of the item going inside of it. And since gold is more dense than uh, silver or any other kind of like other fluid, like then the crown would displace more water if it was dropped into a liquid medium, right? And so he freaks out. He's like, oh my God, I got it. I figured it out. Because he's going to take the crowns. He's going to put them in like different things of water. And he's going to see if it's actually made out of solid gold. And he's like, Eureka, Eureka, I got it. And he jumped out of his bed and started running through the streets of Alexandria, Egypt, naked because he just figured it out. And it actually turns out that the, the crown was actually made out of things that weren't just gold, right? He also even apparently came up with a heat ray and a bunch of other math junk, right? So like Archimedes, phenomenal figure wicked smart. And all of this was started by Alexander the Great, right? To review back over the things we talked about, Philip II, and his father, started this whole trend when he took over the entirety of southern Greece following the Peloponnesian War, right? He used the phalanx, diplomacy, threats, and he took over the entire thing. But unfortunately, he did not get a chance to take over Persia with his son because he was stabbed to death at his daughter's wedding. And then Alexander decides, after two years of being on the throne, that he's going to go over and take over all of Persia, and he goes out to try and take down Darius the Third. Darius the Third runs away from him a bunch, and Alexander, though, still beats him in every battle he encounters him in, in over 300 different battles he wins, even one time when he fought war elephants, and he did the entire thing with his trusty horse, Bucephalus, right? And then also going forward, unfortunately, though, he couldn't take over anything else, because he died, but after his death, the Hellenistic Empire would start. And the Hellenistic Empire is a culturally diffused empire of Egyptian, Persian, Indian, and Greek values, right? That is it. I hope you all enjoyed it. I will see you guys soon. Get ready for your test. We're going to go ahead and review a little bit, though. Y'all have a good one.